In the first chapter of your book, you talk about how a geeky girl fell in love with the brain yes. and how mm -hmm. one of your professors at UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. where you went to school, yeah. was a real inspiration to you. Yeah. Tell us about your relationship with her and the importance of having a mentor in your life. I have been so lucky to have just an extraordinary mentor. So I met her on the very first day of my freshman year um, at UC Berkeley. I took a freshman seminar class called The Brain and Its Potential. I, you know, I just, it just caught my eye. And I'll never forget that first day of class because, first of all, she kind of looked like a science rock star. So she's very tall, very athletic, very beautiful woman. She had this blonde bouffant hairdo that didn't look old fashioned, just kind of made her look even taller. And she had this um, pretty blouse and skirt covered with a very uh, crisp white lab coat. Very, very tall, very large hands, and she had gloves on her hands. But even more striking, um, sitting in front of her on the desk was a hat box. It was a flowered hat box. But what is that doing there? And I'll never forget that first day, she slowly opened the lid and with her gloved hands, very, very lovingly, still remember how she did that, she pulled out a real preserved human brain. The first one that I had ever seen in my whole life. And not only, so that was just a stunning visual for a little freshman in her first day of, of college. But um, what struck me even more was um, that she told us that what she was holding in her hands was the most complex structure known to mankind. And you think, we all have one. It's just right here. You know, you're seeing it in, in her hands now, but we all have one. And it is the most complex thing known to mankind. And she told us about what we call brain plasticity, the ability of the brain to change in response to the environment. And how does that work? And that was her focus of her research. And I thought, that is the most interesting thing <laughs> I have ever heard in my whole life. I want to be a neuroscientist. And so I was very lucky to have taken um, courses with Marion Diamond. She is, um, to this day, the best professor I've ever taken. And the reason is, is because she made it so personal. And she is, it continues to be fascinated with her topic. The, and it was so genuine, her fascination. You wanted to understand it as deeply as she did and appreciate it as deeply as she did just because you can see how, how interested she was in this topic. And by this time, she had been teaching it for 20 years. And I can say now that that's, that's a hard thing to keep up that genuine interest. Um, but she did. And she made everybody learn um, and want to learn right along with her. But then, of course, I was able to work in her lab as well and learn um, uh, how to do scientific research studying brain plasticity. And she, um, so how many di different things did she did? She, she taught me in classes. She showed me what an extraordinary teacher really is. Um, she introduced me to neuroscience. She introduced me to brain plasticity, which is the general topic that I've continued to this day. And so it was a, such a lucky meeting. And I know people say, well, I don't have a mentor. What if I don't have a mentor like that? Well, you know, something that I've realized um, only much later is that, um, so I have to say that um, I, I worked in Professor Diamond's lab when I was a senior and I talked to her maybe two or three times, um, maybe four at the max between, I graduated 28 years ago and today. So there was not a lot of direct, you know, she wasn't telling me, giving me advice about this, giving me advice about that. But what I've noticed is that she served as a role model for many things that came up later. So for example, I noticed in graduate school, the women graduate students, which at that point were 50-50, it was 50-50 male and female in my, my graduate class in neuroscience, they complained about not having a female mentor, a female role model. And I, not very um, charitably, ignored them. Because I said, what are, you, what are you complaining about? I don't understand why you complain. And only later did I realize that I didn't have anything to complain about because I had the female role model. I didn't need to see anybody else succeeding because I had such a, a strong figure in my education. Of course I knew that women could do it. I knew that women who had four children and who had a career and who were extraordinary teachers could do it. Um, not that I put myself in the same 
league as, as her at that point, but it was possible. And I realized that she shielded me from all of that worry that maybe you're not gonna make it because look, there's not that many women out there. And yeah, I noticed it, but it, it never phased me because I was kind of inoculated by having this amazing role model. And even later still, I realized that even how much more um, of a role model she was, because she started in the 1960s where there were almost no women in science. And there she was in the 80s when I was in college, standing there like she belonged there. And it made me realize that that is what women in any profession can do to help other women. Be strong in your conviction that you deserve to be there because you may not mentor somebody and give them advice about this and that and all the little things, but if they see that, if they see that role model, um, that can last a lifetime. And so, yes, I got much more interaction, but her role as a role model um, lasted that 28 years between the time I graduated and today. So um, I've been very lucky and I, I literally try and pay it forward by you know, standing in my role as a role model. And, you know, I'm not perfect, and yet it's great to be able just to stand there and say, I deserve to be there, and you deserve to be there. And um, I, I think we need more um, uh, of that attitude to help women um, kind of move forward at this period of time.